Very good morning to uh, all of you and uh, welcome to uh, Counterpoint Southeast Asia public webinar. Uh, my name is Dennis Hugh and I am a senior research fellow uh, at the Center on Asia and Globalization uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Uh, Counterpoint Southeast Asia is a, a webinar and publication series that tackles strategic uh, and complex questions and issues facing Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, they will be discussed and presented by uh, uh, experts uh, as well as uh, academics uh, around the region. So today's topic uh, and question, main question for discussion uh, is entitled, Is Time Running Out to Realize the ASEAN Economic Community by 2025? Let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, so the ASEAN Economic Community Initiative was first launched about uh, two decades ago uh, by ASEAN leaders at the 2003 uh, ASEAN Summit in, in Bali, Indonesia. And the ASEAN Economic Community is um, you know, in, envisioned to be a highly integrated and inclusive and, and, and uh, inclusive and uh, resilient regional economy to be achieved by 2025. Now, according to the, um, I'll call it AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, the AEC Blueprint 2025, which is a 10-year implementation blueprint uh, published by the ASEAN Tech Secretariat uh, back in 2015, uh, the AEC is uh, uh, envisioned to achieve five key uh, features or character character uh, characteristics. Uh, one is a highly integrated and cohesive economy, two, a competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN, uh, three, enhanced connectivity and sectoral cooperation. Four, a resilient, inclusive, people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN. And five, a global ASEAN. So there are already existing building blocks uh, for this very uh, ambitious uh, economic integration project, uh, which includes uh, some major legally binding economic agreements, such as the ASEAN Trade and Goods uh, Agreement, uh, ATIKA for short, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, ACIA, uh, the ASEAN Trade and Services Agreement, ATISA, uh, as well as numerous types of um, free trade agreements with its major uh, trading partners. Uh, more recently, uh, there is a uh, um, the uh, a regional trade agreement called uh, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is led by ASEAN with its uh, five main dialogue partners, uh, Japan, China, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And that came into force on the 1st of January, 2022. And that kind of fits nicely into the fifth characteristic of ASEAN, you know, uh, a global ASEAN, right? Uh, and according to the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, in terms of implementation of, of the blueprint, they, um, they're a little over halfway there. They seem to have achieved about a little over, uh, over half or 50% of uh, uh, various uh, sectoral work, plan, uh, work plans by uh, 2020. Um, However, in terms of timing, we know that um, uh, in, in 2020, we had the, 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 the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, over that course plunged many uh, economies around the world, uh, including ASEAN, into deep economic recession. Governments around the world had to impose border control restrictions, movement restrictions, quarantine measures. Uh, and that had an impact on the domestic economies, essentially economic activities, particularly in 2020, uh, at the height of the pandemic, was almost at a, at a standstill. Uh, even in ASEAN itself, we was not immune to the pandemic. I think the uh, collectively ASEAN, um, uh, in terms of its economic growth, uh, there were basically there was a contraction by, in 2020 by about 3.2%, according to ASEAN uh, the ASEAN Statistics Handbook, uh, although they, they, uh, there was a gradual moderate rebound from 2021. So from, from 2020 to 2021, we, we began to see many of the, of the economies around the world, including in Southeast Asia, gradually beginning to recover as borders began to, to open up and uh, many of these uh, restrictive movement restrictions began to be re relaxed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we, we know that by 2021, things be the economic environment became uh, has changed again. It's become a lot more hostile. It's become a lot more uncertain. We had, of course, last year uh, the, out the the outbreak of the the war in Ukraine, which continues to be 
to be ongoing. We have got a high elevated inflation, of course, in many ways triggered by, by the war with high energy prices, as well as um, uh, food prices as well. Now, of course, the inflation has become much more broad based. And uh, we, according to the IMF, um, you know, the global economy is now beginning to slow down again. Uh, they're looking at uh, economic growth about 2.9% this year uh, and about uh, from 3.4% last year. And I think over the next one to two years, we're going to see basically a uh, very uh, much more moderate uh, uh, growth. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainties as we move forward. There's, there's, there's a lot of downside risk to these economic prospects, it, not just a prolonged war in Ukraine, high inflation, high public debt, and of course, also um, a lot of financial markets volatilities. Uh, more recently, we know that there are concerns of uh, possible financial contagion from uh, the banking failures we, that we see in, 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 in the US and also in, in Europe. So a lot of concerns about about uh, the financial sector uh, as well. So against this backdrop of uncertainties and, 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 and a, a, a certainly a much more hostile economic environment over the next uh, couple, couple of years, um, you know, I think we, we're only two years away, a little, a little over two plus years away from achieving the deadline of 2025 for the ASEAN Economic Community. So it's time really running out to, to try to realize that by, by by 2025. So to answer this question, we we, we have three uh, experts uh, in 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 this field to discuss and to give their perspectives uh, on this question. So let me just quickly introduce our three speakers uh, in order of speaking sequence. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Julia Tijaja, who is an ASEAN trade and global value chain specialist with uh, 18 years of uh, international public policy experience. From 2015 to 2021, uh, Julia was director of the ASEAN Integration Monitoring um, at the uh, department at the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, and she's worked on very, very key major ASEAN initiatives such as the AAC Blueprint, uh, 2025 midterm review, as well as uh, uh, trade negotiations for RCEP, uh, uh, the ASEAN Com Comprehensive Recovery Framework, and other types of major uh, ASEAN uh, in in initiatives. Our second speaker is uh, Ms. Jean Clarice uh, Carlos. Uh, she is a project development officer at the Philippines Institute uh, for Development Studies, or PIDS for short. Uh, and she's also a senior lecturer at the Institute of Global Studies from at uh, Miriam College. Um, she is uh, the uh, Philippines point person for several ASEAN plus three uh, uh, track um, initiatives, 1.5 and track two in, uh, network initiatives, such as the network of East Asian think tanks, NEED, or the East Asian Development Network and the East Asia Forum. And she's published and co-authored a number of uh, important studies on ASEAN, including uh, how does the Philippines fare in meeting the ASEAN economic community by vision by 2025, e-commerce adoption. And I think we had just had a conversation earlier that you should be currently doing a, a major project looking at um, the digital economy in, in the ASEAN region. Our third speaker is uh, is uh, Dr. Ekapon uh, Chong V. Uh, Laivan. He, she, he is a senior economist, public finance at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and through ADB's lending and technical assistance, he has supported uh, many uh, Southeast Asian governments on public finance management and reforms, including tax reforms, medium-term fiscal planning and budgeting and public debt management. Prior to his current uh, position, he was a country economist for the Philippines in the uh, ADB's uh, Philippines country office. Uh, he joined ADB uh, about 10 years ago, back in 2013, uh, as a young uh, professional, and it has uh, uh, many years of experience over that period of time in various uh, uh, departments from Southeast Asia Department, the Pacific Department, as well as the Strategy and Policy Department. So before we be, uh, I ask our first speaker to speak, uh, for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, please do key in your questions early, uh, and also please uh, do indicate the uh, your questions are directed at which particular speaker, all right? So with that, so let's begin with uh, Julia first. Julia, you have the floor. 
Thank you and uh, good morning, Denise, uh, Jane, Akapon, and those of us joining uh, joining us virtually uh, today. First of all, let me thank the Center of Asia and Globalization for inviting me to speak um, at this webinar today. I'm going to respond uh, uh, to Denise' uh, very, I think, uh, uh, very thought-provoking question maybe for the next five to seven minutes. Uh, whether time is running out uh, to realize the AEC by 2025? Uh, my short answer to that is no. But I would add an, a second layer of questions to that as well. That would very much depend on the kind of AEC that you would seek to realize by 2025. Um, I think it's worth taking a step back, uh, 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 Denise, that to just to recall that the ASEAN economic community, um, as part of the ASEAN uh, community, has in fact been formally established in 2015, right? And that was actually at the end of the implement, uh, implementation of the first blueprint that we have. So these days, when we talk about whether we are, uh, we are able to realize the ASEAN community, whether that's economic, political, security, or social, cultural, um, uh, uh, by a certain period of time, often what we are referring to is whether or not we can substantially or satisfactorily uh, complete the implementation of the prevailing blueprint. So the current blueprint that uh, um, um, that we have for the AEC is the AEC blueprint 2025 that was adopted in 2015, and it's meant to guide the work for the next 10 years from 2016 to 2025. Uh, but answering the question of whether we can finish the implementation of blueprint by 2025 is not straightforward, because what the blueprint does is just to give us the broad strategic directions for the AEC, and some kind of cursory view of the numerous things that we are undertaking under the different AEC sectoral bodies. In fact, under the blueprint, we have more than 23 sectoral work plans that's being implemented by the different ASEAN sectoral bodies. And when I was um, in ASEAN, we did this official midterm review that you, you, you referred to, you mentioned just now earlier as well. And we found that there's actually more than 1700 action lines under these 23 blueprints. And as you rightly mentioned just now, uh, by the time we conduct the midterm review, by the midpoint of the AEC, ASEAN has actually completed more than 54% of those action lines. And there is another, I think, more than 34% that's actually ongoing. So if we are answering your questions in the conventional sense, I would say that ASEAN would be doing a pretty good job in terms of implementing most of those of 1,700 action lines by 2025, probably not all. Now, should we be worried about that? My quick answer to that is no, because even in 2015, when we established the blueprint, we didn't claim to have implemented 100% of the action lines. And at the end of the day, what matters is the quality of the measures that we are implementing. You could be implementing 1,690 action lines by 2025, but if the remaining 10 that you don't implement is the one that's actually most impactful, then I would say then that we are going to leave us with the last meaningful AEC. Um, I would argue that uh, for um, AEC, for to be able for us to confidently say that we have realized the AEC 2025 by, by its deadline, um, ASEAN needs to do three things. First, it needs to complete the high impact measures under its current agenda. Secondly, um, the, the world has completely changed. We are currently facing the poly crisis. We are facing lots of the challenges that we didn't even anticipate when we came up with the blueprint. So ASEAN definitely need to come up with effective responses to those um, challenges, the challenges today and the challenges that we foresee we are going to face tomorrow. And Given that ASEAN currently is doing the fissioning process for the post 2025 agenda, it becomes imperative for ASEAN to start setting out the foundation for the AEC so that come the post 2025 agenda, we would be in the good position to seize the opportunities presented uh, by the future. Now, quickly going through what I meant by the high impact measures, give you an example within the ASEAN internal integration agenda. It's important for ASEAN to conclude a meaningful upgraded ASEAN trading goods agreement, which is they are currently negotiating. Tariffs has been virtually gone for a good period of time in ASEAN, but do we currently have an effective tool to address the non-tariff measures? Or I think more interesting, interestingly, whether ASEAN have the tool to respond to the modern trade challenges. How should trade respond at the time of a crisis? 
how do we position the conversation around trade to the sustainable development? Not because we are simply following the demand or the push from our trading partners, but it's because ASEAN also need to engage in the kind in its own narrative in this regard. In this regard. And I think last but not least, how should we then use trade as a tool to help us to support green transition? I, you know, things like that. On the surfaces, we have the ASEAN Trading Services Agreement, which is a great upgrade from just AFAS in the past. But I is ASEAN uh, um, you know, doing uh, something concrete to tackle the issue of surface facilitation or to look at the issues whether the surfaces uh, um, sector that we have are competitive? We have lots of discussions on that in APEC, I, I knew. But do we have enough of that conversation in ASEAN? Same thing with the sustainable investment, the same thing with strengthening the mechanism to safeguard the regional macro and financial uh, um, uh, stability. On the um, external agenda, um, you mentioned RCEP. So it would be great to be able to see the full implementation of RCEP by 2025, including having the right institutional setup to support the implementation. ASEAN also have a number of ongoing upgrading and review process for its uh, plus one FTAs we mentioned. But I think it's also important for ASEAN to also have a conversation around how does it seek to strengthen its economic relations with its major trade or investment partners who are not yet its FTA partners. I would like to pinpoint the US and the EU. What is ASEAN strategy towards these two partners? And I think that will also then link to your what you mentioned as just now about the geopolitical situation, the global fragmentation, uh, um, um, and, and so on. Uh, going beyond that, um, I don't have time to go through all the sectoral cooperation, but I would say when it comes to the digital um, agenda, ASEAN has been doing a pretty good job, I think, in uh, bringing that to the table. Uh, they have discussions in terms of the vision, the substance of the agenda, including having the right institution to support that implementation. I mean, it's not, it's still more to be done, but at least work is ongoing. Uh, I would say that when it comes to the sustainability, I think that's where the work will have to be, uh, 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 the efforts will have to be redoubled. There is definitely momentum in selected sectors, especially like finance, energy, or agriculture. But there need to be a conversation around a more holistic vision for ASEAN to go towards uh, decarbonization. But taking into consideration that ASEAN member states have very different starting point, very different interests, and very different costs, if you like, um, um, uh, that they're going to face if they're going to undertake this uh, green transition. Uh, before I, I think I got like maybe one uh, one more minute, but I think if we dare to even take steps beyond the blueprint conversation, I would flag there are also issues that I think AEC, AEC needs to start discussing, which may not be sufficiently addressed in the blueprint. But I think they need to start at least start that conversation beyond 2025. And I would call, perhaps highlight um, three of that. The first one is the conversation around competitiveness and productivity. At the moment, I feel that the AEC agenda is a little too trade centric. Um, a lot of the conversation on the main economic agenda is around trade and related areas and the sectoral cooperation. But we have not been talking enough about productivity. And when you talk about productivity, you have to be talking about labor productivity. You've got to be talking about technology and innovation and how you use that to uh, boost productivity. The second one, it's on inclusion. Um, you know, we always have this pillar on people-centered people, -centered people uh, but you know, how is, are we actually really addressing that as part of the um, regional uh, economic integration? And last but not least, which I think you have um, rightly highlighted, this conversation around global fragmentation, decoupling, global supply chain restructuring. Are we having enough conversation about how is that going to impact on ASEAN? Because this is a problem of now. It will be too late for ASEAN to only address this as part of the post-2025 agenda. So I think, uh, uh, Denise, so in short, um, there is still time, but time is running out. Um, but uh, if ASEAN can focus on those key agenda towards 2025, then we would be in the good position to say that we have realized the AEC by 2025. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so, I mean, it, it sounds like in terms of implementation of the AEC, it's, it's, it's quality uh, not, and not just uh, quantity, right? And uh, 
and having a high impact agenda will be quite true. And you've identified some of the key areas um, that, the, that maybe ASEAN policymakers need to focus on. Okay, uh, thank you. Jean, you're next. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Dennis. So good morning, everyone. So first, I would like to thank Dr. Dennis and Jassy and the rest of the organizers of this webinar. So I am very grateful for this opportunity to participate. So it, it's also such an honor to share my views on the subject matter alongside esteemed colleagues, Dr. Julia and Dr. Aikapol. So a brief disclaimer before I start, the views and opinions I will share this morning are not of my institute or government, and my observations are coming from my international relations and public policy lenses, and as a new researcher exploring regional integration, specifically ASEAN. So hence, pertaining to the question, is time running out to realize the ASEAN economic community by 2025? My simple answer is yes. So I agree with Dr. Julia, um, economic community building is an ongoing and nonlinear process and that the ASEAN needs to start thinking about the AEC post-2025 agenda. So just um, to support um, Dennis' um, brief introduction earlier, so the AEC 2025 hopes to bring the economy of the region to the greater heights. So it envisions a single market economy that will make way for rapid economic development and inclusive growth. So eight years after its adoption and three years before its deadline, the conversation about AEC 2025 is now centered on whether or not goals will be achieved at the target deadline, contextualized on the current global and regional challenges and complex domestic issues of individual ASEAN member states. It can be said that the remaining three-year period is not enough to accomplish the AEC blueprint by 2025. So it is important to note that AEC 2025 is not the first blueprint to be crafted by the ASEAN that is geared towards a more cohesive and highly integrated economy. So it's this its predecessor, the AEC Blueprint 2015, was not fully realized by the end of the period. This gave birth to the AEC 2025, which not only extended the deadline for the um, ASEAN economic integration, but also expanded the goals of the AEC, making it more ambitious. So both blueprints advocate for the liberty, stresses new concepts such as sustainability, good governance, connectivity, and innovation. So while the additional goals recognize the cont contemporary developments in the global economy, these new concepts introduced by AEC 2025 have given ASEAN a greater challenge compared to AEC 2020, 2015. And I think AEC post-2025 will be much more complex. So building on Dr. Julia's point earlier, the world has been drastically transformed, transformed which the AEC Blueprint 2025 did not foresee. Two of these are the COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical security issues such as war and conflicts. So this drastic, drastically plagued the economies of not only the ASEAN member states, but the entire globe. So supply chains were interrupted, showing intra-ASEAN and extra-ASEAN trade. So this has caused shortages on supply and higher prices of necessities. This also affected the key ASEAN industries such as tourism, manufacturing, and other services sectors. So moreover, vulnerable economic sectors such as small and medium enterprises is one of the major casualties of the said phenomena, forcing them to stop their operations, especially those who cannot access and lack the know-how in adopting digital solutions. So digital, digitalization may be perceived as one of the drivers in achieving the AEC 2025. However, um, we need to acknowledge that there is still a huge digital divide among the AMS region, especially within its own borders. Um, challenges in the ICT infrastructure, tech education, access to technology, financing, etc. are just examples, are just few examples. To add to my observation that this that time is definitely running out, basically ASEAN member states are occupied occupied or more, more distracted by several key examples, but not limited to economic recovery from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, protectionism, cross-border non-traditional issues, and domestic issues. So regarding um, the first example, the region will still continue to recover for the next few years from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, though revenge tourism and spending, lifting of lockdowns, and adoption of digital economy is persistent. But would this be enough? So regarding protectionism, so just last year, Indonesia banned palm oil export and Malaysia also prohibited the export of chicken. So restriction of foreign influence on countries' economies has become a trend rather than anomaly. So restrictive policies are seen as, seen as protection for the local economy from shortages and supply disruptions. However, this can also have an immense 
effect on ASEAN's effort to integrate the regional economy. So regarding the cross-border issues, so the ASEAN member st states are also diverted to focus on regional international issues such as climate change, um, um, border disputes, and other global geopolitical and security issues as mentioned by Dennis and Dr. Julia earlier. So lastly, on domestic issues that impact the ASEAN member states, may add and may I add that these are not new issues such as aging society, at the same time overpopulation, food and secure, um, energy shortages, the disparity between the rich and poor, corrupt, corruption, and etc. So to conclude, at the rate things are currently going, it is clear that the goals of the AEC blueprint will not be realized by 2025. This is not to discredit the efforts of the ASEAN with substantial progress from 2015 to 2021. So the extensive impact of the COVID-19 on the economy, econ economy prompts ASEAN to reassess the goals of the AEC 2025. It is, um, it is even now too late to reca re recalibrate the goals. So for it to stay relevant, it must integrate solutions to the econ new economic challenges introduced by the events in the past uh, years and also adapt futures and systems thinking. So that's that is my piece, um, Denny. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. So I think Jean, you've uh, you, I think in a way you have a much more pessimistic take on whether we can you know you know we're running out of time and you know to achieve the AEC. And I think you did mention that uh, there's just too many challenges, right? And partly because you know no one expected the, the pandemic and 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 then that, and that is, that's also. Gave, gave rules to a lot of different kinds of challenges that uh, ASEAN member states had to had to deal with. So the the focus really would be to try to rebuild their economies and and so domestic issues in many ways, domestic economic issues kind of uh, take priority over regional ones like the AEC. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jean. So last but not least, um, Ekapon, you're next. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to join uh, Dr. Julia and Jean uh, in thanking um, Dennis uh, and LKYPP uh, to give us uh, the, the opportunity today uh, to share uh, with you um, the insight, uh, especially on very important question, whether the time is running out uh, to achieve the AEC by 2025. Um, I would like to approach uh, this question from the PFM perspective today, the public financial management. Um, basically, the macroeconomic and fiscal uh, stability um, underpins the economic pillar of the ASEAN and also the achievement of AEC uh, by 2025. And it is undeniable that um, the impact of COVID-19 um, has shaken uh, that macroeconomic and fiscal uh, sustainability um, especially in the region. Uh, we have seen uh, in all countries uh, in ASEAN, uh, in the backdrop of COVID-19, um, the, uh, the sharp rise uh, 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 in the fiscal deficit, um, as well as the public debt. Uh, even though uh, uh, most countries in the region have bounced back very strongly um, in 2022 and also this year as well, but we have seen that um, uh, the extent of uh, putting back the fiscal sustainability has been gradual. Um, and I think the region has learned a lot uh, from the lesson from 1997 Asian financial crisis, as well as the 2008-2009 the global financial crisis that uh, the process of the fiscal consolidation should be gradual. And uh, with the rise in the uh, global uncertainties about um, uh, the disruption to the supply chains, um, the rise in the interest rate in advanced economies, um, the rise in the global oil prices and com commodity prices, <clears throat> uh, the governments in the region should be very careful uh, in terms of uh, uh, embarking on the fiscal consolidation effort. Um, and as a result, I believe that um, the government in ASEAN has been on the right track uh, to uh, gradually taper uh, the fiscal deficit um, and continue to sustain much needed spending, uh, especially on the health, education, social protection, and infrastructure. Um, but having said that, uh, one of emerging challenges uh, that for myself uh, uh, on the day-to-day -day basis, having the dialogue with the governments in the region is about the domestic resource mobilization. Uh, why domestic resource mobilization uh, become a, a much more interesting, uh, important agenda is that 
um, there are only two ways uh, to finance much needed spending, uh, which is important to sustain the economic recovery. One way is <clears throat> to borrow for the spending, right? Um, the government can borrow uh, to finance uh, the budget and uh, the fiscal deficit. But this way is not sustainable, given that in the backdrop of COVID-19, uh, many countries already breached um, the, the international threshold of 60% of GDP, uh, public debt to GDP ratio, um, and borrowing more uh, means that they are compromising the fiscal sustainability um, and also may run into the high risk of debt distresses. Um, the second way to finance um, uh, the, the public spending is to increase the tax revenue. And this is the only policy option um, that can, on the one hand, sustain much needed spending, and on the other hand, achieve uh, the fiscal and macroeconomic st uh, stability, uh, including the fiscal consolidation. Um, nevertheless, uh, DRM has always been uh, the challenge in the region, even before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for the reasons uh, that um, uh, the tax to, to GDP ratio in the region over around 14 to 15% for decades, right? Um, and with the impact of COVID-19, we have seen uh, the plunge in the tax to GDP ratio, um, meaning that the ability for the governments um, to finance um, the counter cyclical uh, uh, budget support spending uh, 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 basically is um, being compromised. Um, and as a result, um, the tax authorities um, around the region are under the pressure um, to increase the tax revenue. And the question is how to do it without compromising uh, the prospect of economic recovery and strong growth. Um, I would like to take this opportunity today uh, to highlight some of the challenges um, uh, on the one hand, which also uh, shed light on the opportunity uh, for the DRM policy on the other hand. The first one is about um, the informal sector in the region. Uh, in Southeast Asia, informal sector account for about 20% of GDP, meaning that 20% of economic activities are operating outside the tax systems. Um, and therefore, there's a huge opportunity for tax authorities in the region uh, to bring in the informal sector into the tax net. And how to do it? Um, we can do it without even a change in the tax policy. Um, the tax effort in the region, uh, tax effort is defined as the ratio between the actual tax revenue to um, the tax potential. In Southeast Asia, it ranges between 60 to 75%, compared with 90% 90, 90 uh, in OECD. <clears throat> Meaning that if the tax authorities um, uh, improve the tax administration, either by the making the tax compliance uh, more accessible, uh, simplifying the rules and regulations in terms of tax registration, filing tax return and payment, um, including adopt adoption of the new technology um, like the blockchain, um, including the, the IT technology to modernize um, the business processes within the tax administration. This could yield uh, significant gains uh, in the tax revenue in the short term without any policy change. Um, the second one is on um, the inefficient tax administration. Um, currently, the tax efficiency in the region is only about 75% uh, only in the region, uh, meaning that there is a huge room for the tax authorities uh, to improve uh, the efficiency um, uh, of the tax administration, and this could involve um, uh, 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 to strengthen uh, the uh, list-based uh, tax audit um, to ensure uh, better enforcement of the tax law and regulations, um, simplifying some uh, 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 tax filing, especially VAT um, and CIT to improve the efficiency. Uh, the third one is more on the subnational taxation. Um, you would be surprised that uh, uh, out of 15% of the tax to GDP ratio, right, on average in the region, less than 1% is the revenue collected by the subnational government or the local government. Um, and partly because of uh, the low efficiency for the real property taxes. Um, uh, in the Philippines, for example, um, the, the government has embarked on um, uh, the third package of the comprehensive tax reform program, right, to modernize um, the real property valuation uh, in order to improve the uh, real property taxation. And for, for me, this is an extremely important 
uh, policy impetus uh, to boost uh, the domestic revenue. And the fact that this is the most sustainable source of revenue for the local government, it also contributes directly to the service delivery. And the last one is on the growing digital economy. I'm sure that Jean will also touch upon this. Um, currently, the digital economy accounts for about uh, 174 billion US dollar as of 2022. And that number could go up to 1 trillion by 2030. Um, nevertheless, uh, the legal framework uh, for tax systems in ASEAN still implicitly assume the brick and mortar businesses, um, meaning that um, only the firms who have the uh, physical presence in the country and the life income uh, from the country uh, will need to be uh, paying uh, the corporate income tax, individual income tax, or register for VAT. With the rise in the VA, uh, the, the digital economy, um, it has caused the loophole in the tax system in the sense that there's so many incomes that derive from uh, the digital transaction. For example, uh, I'm now in uh, Philippines, right? Uh, I pay for Netflix um, or Facebook services um, uh, for in the headquarter based in Singapore. Um, and therefore, this gives rise to the challenge for the tax authorities in the Philippines, um, how we can bring that digital economy into the tax net. Um, and, um, uh, and from the firm perspective, I have to, to say that the firms are more than willing to pay tax in the Philippines um, for the reason that these are the indirect tax, right? They are able to pass on to consumer. Um, and um, uh, to ensure that sustainable um, businesses, uh, they are better comply with the domestic uh, tax rules um, rather than uh, uh, being operating outside tax system and has caused um, um, uh, some uh, non-compliance issue in, in the near future. Um, and uh, there are so many platforms uh, uh, in the world at the moment that has emerged uh, in order to address the issue that of the digital economy. Um, there are two main platforms um, that I believe that ASEAN could take an advantage of. Um, one is the OECD G20 inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, uh, people call it BEPS uh, inclusive framework. Um, uh, this one is uh, 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 the platform that will define how to reallocate incomes um, derived uh, from multiple countries and also discuss about uh, the minimum corporate income tax of 15% uh, in order to avoid the comp tax competition in the region. And, and the second platform is called the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information on Tax Purpose. Um, this one is to uh, uh, advocate the tax transparency and exchange of information among the tax authority. Um, and uh, the challenge at the moment uh, for the region is that uh, these are very complex and it's very new to many tax authorities. Um, and there's a laws uh, for the uh, development partners like the Asian Development Bank um, to work hand in hand uh, with the governments and tax authorities um, in the region uh, to make sure that they are part of the dialogue um, at the multilateral level and they are able to implement um, the rules and minimum standard uh, to ensure that they can uh, optimize uh, the advantage of the digital economy. Um, let me stop here, Dennis. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ekapon. So Ekapon has uh, in, in, in focused on uh, domestic resource mobilization, tax cooperation, which is a very important uh, pillar of the AAC 25 group. I think it's under the, the second characteristic, right? Competitive, innovation, dynamic assets. So if you take a look at that blueprint, you'll see uh, much of what Ecopon is, uh, has uh, recommendations has made is, is linked to that. And I think that's also very important to achieve the AEC. I think Ecopon also raised a very interesting point, right? Uh, you know, all the member states are trying to build the economy, like the rest of the world, because of the pandemic, right? Um, and you only have two options, and one is to borrow. But the trouble is that we all know that many economies have spent so much, there's very little fiscal space left for them to uh, provide the kind of cash transfers to households and businesses, uh, which they've been doing for the last couple of years. And we also know borrowing costs has also gone up because of, you know, we, are, we are living right now and for some time in a much more high interest rate regime. So your only second option, of course, is to is tax revenue. And, and I think Ekapon has talked a lot about some of the things that can be done to to try to address uh, to make tax um, collection and, and other other recommendations more efficient. Uh, so um, thank you all three. I think what I'll do before uh, I, I go to um, the the questions in uh, in the Q and A box is maybe just 
to squeeze in my own question to each of you first. So maybe I'll start with Julia first, right? Julia, you, you mentioned in uh, in your discussion that the economic community building is not it's not a it's a non-linear process, right? And I think you talked about that too. It's kind of uh, the AEC is is not static, and it's in a way, right? It's not a kind of a final destination. Uh, but you know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that because my thinking is that if it's non if it's a non-linear process then wouldn't that be difficult to monitor and, and to me measure the, the progress in, 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 in terms of uh, economic integration efforts? Julia? Right. Thank you, thank you, Denise. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's as an economic community building, it's non-linear as in, you know, you don't have this final destination, right? And you, know, you establish the AEC and it's done. Until now, we are still doing this ASEAN economic uh, a community uh, a building process because at the same time, uh, the AEC is not operating in a vacuum. We got affected by the different things, the different mega trends that, 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 that that's taking place in the region. When the pandemic hit, it actually affect our uh, um, um, AEC agenda, for example. Um, the same thing now, when you do have this geopolitical major power rivalry, the same thing. We also actually need to th think about what the impact it has on the AEC. Uh, so if I can elaborate a little bit more, um, it's non-linear in the sense that your agenda is not static. Currently, AEC is operating based on this 10-year blueprint, right? But in 2015, it was not possible for ASEAN to foresee all the relevant things that we are facing now. We didn't know there's going to be a pandemic then, the Russia-Ukraine war, for example, and even the current decoupling that we are, uh, we are seeing. Um, that has a few implications. So the first one is, even your existing agenda might actually need adjustment and updating. Um, and I think you know we've seen that, for example, when it comes to trade, maybe in the past we think of that more about just tariffs or perhaps then trade facilitation on tariff measures as well. But digital technology has completely changed trade and presented huge opportunities. How is ASEAN going to take advantage on that, uh, of that? Or now there's a growing realization that trade could in fact be a very useful tool to support green transition. That is was not part of the objective of the trade agenda in the AEC. How then can we actually take that into account? Similarly, you might have new agenda that was not foreseen and you might need to add that. And it's a little bit too late to only add this every 10 years, right? To basically, basically add this for the post-2025 agenda. And we've seen ASEAN addressing that. In the past, we only have ICT. Now we are talking about digital and ASEAN is doing a pretty good job having all the mechanism to discuss digital, but is that enough? Because you shouldn't also be discussing digital as a separate sector in silo, right? Actually, all your sectors need to be thinking about digital sustainability and all that. How can we do that? Um, and I think that uh, lastly, how that will affect the community build, um, the AEC agenda, is the fact that many of the issues that we are facing is becoming more complex and more cross-cutting. So when you think about the pandemic, it affects both health and the economy, right? And it was only until very recently that we've seen, for example, the health and the finance sector come together and have a dis like meaningful discussions on this. And I would love to see that same thing happening, for example, in the area of human capital. ASEAN economic competitiveness cannot be built if we do not build our workforce. And yet conversation around education and labor at the moment comes under the social and cultural pillar. And I don't think currently there is a strong enough mechanism or at least implementation of that mechanism that would allow AEC to have that meaningful discussions as to how can we build an industry responsive, a future-proof uh, uh, workforce. The discussions is taking place, I think, but largely in the social community pillar, but that should be a very big part of the AEC uh, discussions as well. Um, yes, it will make monitoring a bit harder, but I think that we have time to do a little bit of thinking of that. So I think, you know, if as long as we are not too rigid in terms of what we are monitoring, you know, we are moving away from that very strict checklist uh, situation that you have a checklist that would last you for ten uh, for a period of ten years. I think there is room to address that. You know, you could be thinking about maybe um, 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 internalizing the review process for your sectoral work plans, for example. 
all be pitching your vision and objective at the broader level that will be addressing things like resilience, sustainability, inclusion in a much more uh, 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 strategic uh, level, I would say, then allowing different things, initiatives, mechanisms to be added to contribute to that uh, strategic uh, goals. I think and that will in a way help you monitor uh, ASEAN community building in a more agile way. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Julia. Okay, uh, Jean, um, I, I, I'd like to ask you a question too. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned uh, that um, they, there was an earlier AEC blueprint, right, uh, that before this uh, in 2015, and I think you, you did mention that, um, you know, in the new AEC blueprint 2025, uh, it's, it's much more expansive in scope, and that's one of the challenges, right? And one of them, of course, is looking at uh, enhancing regional connectivity, um, which I think, in my point of view, was a bit of an oversight in the original blueprint, right? That they didn't include connect. Hence, there was another separate master plan for um, for ASEAN connectivity. So we do know that. Uh, so we, now we have the AEC Blueprint 2025 that talks about connectivity, strengthening connectivity, but we also have a master plan for ASEAN Connectivity 2025. So, and I think that's a very important component, but do you, do you in your opinion, do you think these two, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, blueprints, master plans are well coordinated? Because I think connectivity is, is actually a very key component of economic integration. Oh, thank you so much, Dennis, for that question. So to be more op optimistic this time, so my answer is yes. So the AEC 2025 and MP MPAC 2025 complement each other. However, these two are very good on paper, but the question is, are they good in practice? So as Dr. Julia mentioned earlier, the implementation of the work plans and action lines of the AEC are, are there. So I also agree with Dr. Julia that the ASEAN should look into improving its monitoring and reporting mechanism to also identify pain points and empower the secretariat further. So with this, now, Dennis, like given my short answer, if you may, I would like to um, ask Dr. Julia a question, but she could answer it later on or if you may. So I would like to take advantage of this platform to ask Dr. Julia. So in your previous capacity as the director of ASEAN integration monitoring of the ASEAN Secretariat. I am very curious to know the main challenges in collecting the data necessary for monitoring. So maybe also lack of data thereof to collect. So I had this co-authored study back in 2020 in meeting the ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025. So one of our major challenges back then in mapping, visualizing, and analyzing the data is the lack of recent data um, in the given the five-year mark. So I just think um data is very important in monitoring and as well as like if we want to explore having a blueprint post-2025. So um, that's my main question. Um, and that was my short answer then. So it was, it was a yes. So thank you. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, Julia, you do want to answer that? I think it's it's about uh, the, the challenges and uh, when I think Jean was looking at, I think it was your study on the Philippines, right? Whether you could find the more recent data in terms of, uh, in terms of benchmarking them, right? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anis and Jane. Thanks for that, that important question. I think, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's a challenge that we face uh, and it comes in multiple level. So for example, if you want, I mean, it, so it really depends on the kind of data that, that, that you're looking at. If it's really about the progress of implementation, for example, I mentioned you have a blueprint, you have the 23 sectoral work plans. Now, not all of the, those work plans are actually made public, right? So even for us at the monitoring part, we are actually doing very detailed monitoring internally, and the officials actually get very regular reporting and very detailed reporting on, uh, on our part. But of course, this reporting is often done um, at the regional level. So, you know, we will be getting update either intersessionally or during the meeting from the representative of the government officials. Now, we may not get the detail as to what is the status in country. So very specific example, you have an action plan that all 10 ASEAN member states need to have a competition policy, right? And then you have, I don't know, eight countries already have that, and you have two that have not. But at what state, then you might get that kind of verbal update during the meeting and so on. But of course, um, even our resources at the regional level, it's very difficult to kind of um, uh, 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 ver uh, ver verify that. Uh, but that said, I think, you know, they need to be um, 
we need to manage expectation as to how much of that can be done at the regional level. There is a lot of things that needs to be done at the national level as well. And I know, for example, at least you know, in the case of, uh, of Indonesia, they're making this effort to really try and monitor progress of implementation across the different ministries of agencies of the different AEC, uh, 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 AEC initiatives. And I recall, for example, I think it was in the Philippines, um, but I don't know whether that's the same study that you referred to that Philippines actually did an excellent job in coming out with this quite a detailed study, we thought, on what is the progress of implementation. And I think it's because they have actually a vehicle, I think a committee that allowed for discussions and updating and you know almost like a real-time updating of the initiatives. And that helps because often the implementer might not be the main beneficiary of a specific action line, right? So if you have a committee a, 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 a committee, or even a broader committee of practice on that, it actually helps the different stakeholders to check on each other and to see and find out where the bottleneck is. But this brings me back to the regional level that my hope is moving forward. ASEAN can really look at the current ME framework that they have and think about how this can be improve. So it shouldn't be just about rigid tracking and up internal updating and so on. But I think it's useful to have that, uh, to, to give that a much more uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, a, a use value as well in terms of identifying implement bottlenecking. And then, you know, referring that to the right mechanism on how you can actually address that problems. Uh, but this is, I mean, this could be like a separate session on its own on this M&E because it's very interesting and the subject is very close to my heart as well, Dennis. Jane, thank All you. Right. Thanks, Pia. Okay, Akapon, uh, I think you you talked about, um, you know, how difficult it is to, um, uh, or at least the, 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 there hasn't been the issues about how they are taxing digital transactions, right? Uh, you talked about. Um, because I, I think most in, in, in most countries, they're looking at it in terms of production rather than uh, of, of rather than looking at it in terms of digital transactions. And I think if I'm correct, at the last WTO ministerial conference, there was an agreement to also extend the moratorium on applying duties to electronic transmissions, I think up to this year, right? So, I mean, on the one hand, we know that e-commerce, digital trade is a growing area, right? It's, a, it's, it's going to be probably one of the major drivers of economic growth in ASEAN. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, I think you're, you're talking about the challenges and how to tax uh, these kinds of digital uh, e-commerce transactions. But so I, I guess the, the question I'm asking you is, how do you find that balance? Because you know, if you if you start to impose different kinds of uh, duties on uh, on digital transactions, you might if it's if it's not done well, then you know you could actually hamper growth in e-commerce, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting question, uh, Dennis. Um, but let me put it in this way. Um, when it comes to the rise of the digital economy, right? Uh, this is the process of the technological change, uh, just like how uh, the production undergo, underwent um, uh, the process of industrialization uh, in 1950, 1960, right? Uh, so it's the technological change, uh, basically. And that's change uh has created um the gaps uh in the tax systems uh in the sense that uh, the most tax regulations and legal framework uh, especially in developing countries uh, in ASEAN um uh, usually was prepared like 30 40 years ago uh, where most of the economic activities and transaction uh, are done on a traditional basis uh, through more, uh, brick and mortar businesses um, but with the rise of the digital economy, right, with or without the change in tax policy, there is always uh, the increase in the digital transaction. Um, and as a result, uh, this has been the challenge uh, for the tax authorities, how to bring um, that digital economy uh, into the tax system or put it in the tax net, uh, in the domestic uh, uh, the tax legal framework. Um, and usually the current tax legal framework uh, of any countries uh, in the region, um, it doesn't recognize uh, the foreign uh, 
uh, business entities which have no business registration in the region mm. um, as the tax resident. And as a result, um, uh, those firms who provide uh, the digital services um, uh, uh, like the Facebook, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, Google, so on and so forth, um, they are not aligned with the domestic tax law. And, and as a result, uh, there's no instrument uh, for the tax authorities uh, to bring in those economic activities inside the tax systems. Um, these are the main issue. And your question is, um, to what extent we can ensure that we strike the balance uh, between revenue mobilization and to ensure that there will be no disruption to the growing digital economy. Yeah. Um, I would say that there will be two parameters. One is about fairness, and second is about efficiency, right? Um, uh, 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 I, I think uh, many countries uh, in ASEAN at the moment um, have brought out uh, uh, the legislation uh, or domestic legal framework um, to ensure that um, uh, the, the digital transaction um, uh, basically uh, are subject to VAT, value added tax, or GST in the context of Singapore. Um, even though the firms who provide those services um, are not the tax resident, um, there must be a kind of the separate uh, legal framework uh, saying that um, uh, the tax authorities are entitled to impose VAT uh, on foreign uh, companies providing the digital services. And that creates um, the fairness in the tax system uh, with the domestic player. For example, if you are a startup, uh, in Singapore, uh, sorry, in, say in Philippines, um, you want to compete with uh, the digital firms uh, from Singapore who provide uh, the services uh, in Philippines. Um, the tax authorities need to ensure the fairness, right? That the startup in the Philippines should have the level playing field uh, with any digital service provider, regardless of where they are. And that is the law of the tax policy and DST. Um, and on the efficiency, um, of course, the, the intention is not to uh, uh, impose additional layers of tax administration uh, in the process of uh, 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 the VAT collection. Uh, it has to be simple, and it also needs to be congruent uh, with the existing VAT law. Um, uh, in the context of the Philippines, um, uh, I think the government are also embarking on the VAT on digital transaction, which essentially impose uh, equivalent VAT uh, at 12 percent to the digital service uh, provider, even though they don't have uh, the, the the tax registration or are the tax resident in the Philippines, um, and that has created uh, the the fairness and efficiency in the in the tax system. Um, that will be my answer about about the the issue of uh, uh, how to strike uh, the balance uh, of promoting the digital economy and lessening the tax revenue. Thanks, Ekepon. Okay, let me let me start to. We do have a few questions in the uh, Q and A box, so let me try to ask them. I think the first one is actually addressed to any one of you, uh, to any of the panelists who would like to answer it. So, uh, I think the question is: since the difficult reforms are likely to be backloaded, um, what are the areas of reform that uh, may be left unaddressed? Uh, you know, leading up to twenty twenty five. And, and what next? Are we looking at another blueprint after 2025, particularly if you can't uh, achieve um, uh, many of these initiatives or there are new challenges? So what's next? Yeah. Anybody wants to tackle this? What about Julia? Why don't you start first? I think you're, you're quite close to it. worked a lot, lot of these blueprints, AEC particularly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. I, um... No, it's, it's, it's difficult to pin down on the specific measures that will be unimplemented, but issues wise, so it's probably those things that I highlighted in my earlier presentation. So especially those that do not currently have existing vehicle or mechanism to address that. So things like, I would say, uh, um, addressing the productivity question, right? At the moment, there isn't a specific sector or body in AEC that would actually uh, be able to deal with that comprehensively, right? Whether or not we need that or we need a different kind of more innovative kind of approach, I think that is still open to discussions. The second one is on the inclusion or even the equitable economic development. 
if you look at one of the questions, uh, one of the publications at the end of the first blueprint, it says there that we have implemented 100% on equitable economic development. But I think we all know that, you know, I don't know what how narrow is that list of that 100%, but definitely there's a lot of work that needs to be done then. But this, this would require, I think, a broader conversation, including how would ASEAN community as a whole, because when you talk about economic equitable economic development, it goes beyond just the AEC, right? You're going to be addressing the poverty issue, for example, for example, social protection and things like that. So it's probably need to be quite cross-sectoral between AEC and the ASCC. The third one, I would say, you know, this is difficult to, to pin down what would be the most important tagline, whether it could be supply chain or global economic architecture or whatever it is. But, and it's given the increasingly complex interconnection between economics and political, ASEAN, I think it's high time for ASEAN to have to have a discussions on that. And I think even 2025 might, might be too late for that because this is something that's already happening uh, here and now. And they need to be a conversation of how ASEAN would like to respond to this. I think there has been lots of these uh, uh, um, uh, positions on a more normative level about ASEAN not wanting to be a proxy and so on, but a more concrete conversation from the AEC part also need uh, uh, need to take place. So yeah, I think you know, is in short, it will be those issues that currently do not have ready mechanism, sector bodies, or whatever <clears throat> it is. Uh, especially those that actually have a more cross-cutting, cross-pillar implications that is likely not going to be fully addressed by twenty twenty-five. Okay, thanks. Anybody else would like to address that point? Hi, yeah, yeah. Hi, oh, Dennis. Jean, okay. oh, yes. Yeah, just uh, for the first question, like areas to, of reform that may be left un undressed come 2025. So I just want to highlight the characteristic number four, which is the resilient, inclusive, people oriented, and people centered um, ASEAN economic community. So just building on um, Dr. Akapo's um, um, discussion earlier on the MSMEs, and also like I would like to add like the public. Uh, private partnership in the Philippines. So I just want to share um, the results of one of my most recent studies um, regarding the roles of the government and at the same time the private sector in empowering the um, MSMEs, especially the women-led one. So we surveyed the policy environment and the efforts of the private sector. So our research came about um, this observation that the private sector has a lot of um, efforts to to help the MSME, especially the women-led ones. Um, for example, specifically like the informal sector. So we have this um result. Um, once um when you are considered the informal sector in the Philippines, especially if you're an MSME, you MSMEs, you have um very restrictive access to the government finances, um, government finances, government aid, especially during the pandemic. At, at the same time, um, they don't have access in um in banks, like loans from banks. So the role of the um, PPP back then um, was to support those MSMEs, spe specifically those women that in the informal sector. So I think uh, another blueprint, perhaps we need to, to address like the, the issues of uh, more than the MSMEs, we also need the, to address the issues of gender, gender-based issues at the same time, the informality. So I think informality is very rampant. But at the same time, there is a question, do we really want um, those women at MSME is to formalize at the same time. So that's my brief answer to the first question. Thanks, Jean. Mm -hmm. Ekwandi, would you like us to? Yes, uh, I want to ship in for my good friend's question also, Jayan um, <laughs> uh, Thank you for a, a very insightful uh, question as usual. Um, uh, before I, I answer this question, uh, I want to highlight uh, 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 my opinion that, uh, in my opinion, the achievement of AEC by 2025 is not the finish line, but it's more like um, the goalpost, the milestone uh, for the regional economic integration um, in Southeast Asia. Um, and therefore, there are always um, unfinished uh, businesses uh, for uh, uh, ASEAN community to work together. And given that um, the global economy now uh, is under the huge uncertainties uh, in the next year, next few years, there will be uh, so many emerging challenges uh, 
um, uh, which have not been uh, taken into consideration in the current uh, AEC blueprint. Um, uh, and at the same time, there's uh, always uh, the issue that happened at the global and regional level, um, which necessitate uh, the collective effort uh, or collaboration among the members uh, of ASEAN to work together. Um, one issue, um, just to be specific about your question, which I think um, uh, will require uh, much more uh, work and collaboration among the members of ASEAN, uh, and also in the context of AEC is on the climate change. Um, at the moment, uh, I think in the AEC blueprint, uh, if I'm not mistaken, climate change is kind of the, the standalone theme, right? Uh, it, uh, attached to the, the commitment to the Paris Agreement. Um, but when it comes to climate change, um, with the more severe natural disaster, uh, it becomes a cross-cutting issue. Uh, for example, uh, for myself, um, with the work in ADB, uh, in the public finance uh, or PSM sector, right? Uh, the, finan the, the financing of the, the GHG remission or, or climate change um, is the utmost important agenda, uh, even in, in terms of the, the PFM. And the same go for the infrastructure, transport, urban, uh, governance, uh, gender, um, uh, and, and therefore, I, I believe that uh, uh, the AEC blueprint also need to evolve, um, given uh, uh, the regional commitments uh, to the Paris Agreement, right? And, and we have to approach um, this issue in kind of more holistic way, not just look at climate change as climate change, um, but the climate change uh, in almost every aspect um, of the, the AEC uh, action plan or roadmap, basically. Um, uh, uh, let, let me stop here. Very, very short answer. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ekapon. I have two questions here from my good friend, Dependa, and maybe I can try to combine them. Um, I think from the first question, uh, and, and, and many of you talked about the different challenges that's, that's happened, right, uh, since uh, in 2020 onwards. Uh, and, and many of the economies have been really ill-equipped Ill to address this, whether it's a pandemic or, or the war and, and, and high inflation. So I think what, the question that he he was he raised is that um, is there any efforts by uh, the ASEAN poli policymakers to recognize these vulnerabilities? You know, uh, it, and certainly not just in ASEAN, uh, around the world, uh, the it, it has exposed uh, the lack of capacity, particularly in in the health, uh, public health, and the others to address these kinds of uh, uh, I would call them black swan events, right? Uh, and whether they can adjust these integration plans accordingly. Uh, I mean, may, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, one of the arguments I think Dependa is saying is, you know, five years, yeah, you have a midterm review halfway, five years is too long because we're living in a very dynamic world now. And uh, particularly since the pandemic, everything keeps changing, right? So um, maybe there's a need to have shorter term kinds of reviews, maybe I don't know, every two years or something. Maybe there is already, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Julia or, uh, or uh, Gene Aikabo can can respond to that one. So whether these, uh, because of all these challenges, uh, that's very dynamic. Yeah, whether uh, they're whether ASEAN poli policymakers are recognizing them, uh, these vulnerabilities, and whether they're trying to address them uh, in in their integration plans or or other kinds of uh, initiatives. Right. I think the second question from Dependa is also related. Um, and I think it's it's also related to the first one in the sense that it also exposes the vulnerabilities in terms of uh, pol uh, co coordination, right? Whether it's within, to me, it's coordination within internally among government agencies, but also regional coordination, right, uh, uh, um, among uh, member states. Um, and I think he, they said quite, uh, in his question, there's little mention in 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 the conversations around the design of the AAC in terms uh, in terms of reforms and how they can uh, strengthen or implement uh, meaningful coordination uh, and to discuss and implement new initiatives. So maybe the, maybe, maybe the panel could also share how, um, what they can do in terms of strengthening uh, regional coordination in addressing many of these kinds of new challenges, whether it's a pandemic or, or na a natural disaster or future, right? Future kinds of uh, crisis and challenges that may come, who knows, you know, in the next one or two years. Maybe Julia, would you would you like to, or or Jean or Akapon like to 
Mm. Yeah, very quickly, uh, Denise. Yeah, I mean, indeed, I think, you know, some of these issues raised by uh, Dipinder has been, um, uh, this, uh, have started to be discussed. And in some cases, they are actually ASEAN has also come up with responses. So give you an example on the supply chain issues or the supplies on essential goods. Um, I think within that same year of the uh, pandemic at the end of 2020, ASEAN already come up with the MOU to address um, uh, uh, implementation on NPMs on essential goods. Started off with um, health-related products, but then later on the list get expanded to also cover uh, food and agricultural products, given the importance of food security, for example. The same thing with the food security situation, and I'm pretty sure that arise from, among others, uh, concern over uh, food inflation, right, in, in recent years, including because of the impact of the Russia-Ukraine Russia, Russia uh, war. Um, Indonesia, for example, has picked up food security as one of its priority issues for uh, this year's chairmanship in its capacity as the um, ASEAN chair. And I think it's also started to realize that you can't just look at food security from the agriculture sector alone. It has to be something that is holistic. You've got to think about, for example, the financing side. You've got to think about the logistics and the supply, supply chain side, as well as the trade side as well. So this is, I think, is going to be the trends that we see moving forward, much more cross-cutting, much more uh, complex, is complex issues, that issues that's going to gain increased importance along the way of implementing this 10 years agenda. On the data part, yes, I think for the past few years, ASEAN has come up with various data governance um, initiative. There is a data, uh, I think data management framework, if I recall the name of the documents correctly, they already have the contractual, the model contractual clauses, for example, uh, 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 for, 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 uh, for data, they are looking on I items such as issues relating to data um, governance. Um, and of course, at the moment, they are looking into um, accelerating the negotiation for the ASEAN uh, Digital Economy Framework Agreement, which is going to be extremely key, I think, to, to elevate ASEAN uh, co digital cooperation, which currently comes under different documents, Digital Integration Framework, ASEAN Agreement on e-commerce, and things like that. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody yeah. else want to chip in? Yeah. Yeah, hi, that is, I just like to highlight um, um, three um, from the questions of uh, um, Dipinder. Um, I would like to acknowledge the ground level, the domestic coordination, and the issue of data. So I would like to um, talk about myself as a serial think tanker. So I advocate for the inclusion of think tanks and academics in the um, on the all the ASEAN um, um, platform. So for example, in the Philippines, um, there's this ASEAN um, members technical board. So it convenes, um, I think, um, four times a year or... Um, or depending on the need. So the ASEAN um, members technical board is composed of the government officials and different government agencies. And I'd like to point out if we want to ref really reflect or if we really want to have a ground level to up and not only like the top down approach, I think um, um, given like the st um, stakeholders, st stakeholders consultation are also happening. But at the same time um, in for example, um, as you mentioned earlier in your discussion, I am like an advocate of the inclusion of Track 1.5 and Track 2. So um addressing the pin on the pin, there's um questions. So that I would like to throw it out there. Like we really need to include our think tanks and academics on on the conversations. So I think there are um efforts, for example, track 1.5 and track two efforts of the ASEAN body, but at the same time in the domestic level, um each ASEAN member states really need to recognize the role of these institutions. At the same time, um, level it up um, in the ASEAN um, platform that we need to send representatives from our academics at the same time our think tankers to really, you know, um, contribute or to really um, voice out what is happening to the ground. At the same time, um, those think tankers and those academics have have the more specific or ground level data from the stake different stakeholders. So that's my um contribution to this question that is yeah yeah the, i i agree with you i think there's there's a need to have uh, uh particularly better coordination among the track two because they are an important resource right to provide a lot of unnecessary technical expertise to support them and my sense is asean is a bit better prepared than a lot of other regional organizations in addressing natural disasters and and and, and issues like that uh, 
Um, you know, I've always been advocating that there's a need for, you know, emergency preparedness, uh, kind of a policy toolkit. And I think uh, in, in many ways, I think ASEAN is a bit more advanced. Of course, you have the AHA Center that deals with um, natural disasters. So there are quite a few things going on there, I think, and um, to be to be uh, better prepared, you know, and and and, and better uh, coordinated. But yeah, there's, I guess there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, okay. Um, um, sorry, Ekapon, do you want to say anything, or should, uh, let me let me go to the next question? Yeah, maybe really quickly. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dennis, uh, I, I want to uh, share my insight uh, from my head, uh, from the development partner perspective. Right? I, I think uh, ASEAN AEC definitely is a very unique uh, platform for the regional um, uh, economic collaboration, right? Especially in face of uh, many emerging challenges like food security, um, climate change, um, gender, global warming. Um, uh, 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 this is a provide very uh, a good platform for the countries to come together uh, and share their uh, challenges, uh, opportunity, and it also provide kind of uh, the benchmarking uh, exercise in terms of where they are in terms of the domestic reforms, uh, what are the challenges, uh, exchanging notes, um, uh, and uh, in a consultative um, manner. Um, but in my opinion, just put it in the general context, right? I, I think uh, uh, for uh, development partners, uh, multilateral development bank uh, like ADB, I, I think we also play a quite critical role in that process as well. Um, uh, when we have uh, the platform for discussion, consultation, brainstorming, often when it comes to implementation of the policy or the action to address those challenges, uh, sometimes uh, there is a constraint in terms of the technical capacity, uh, resource availability, um, uh, and also uh, 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 where to bounce the idea. Um, uh, because sometimes when it comes to larger platform, it doesn't happen too often. But in terms of working with the ministerial level at the working level, um, they need consultation on the day-to-day -day basis. And I, I think um, development partners like Asian Development Bank uh, really, really come in uh, to fill up that gap, right? Because we have uh, the resources through the technical assistance. Um, we also have in-house and external expert to work on hand in hand on a day-to-day basis uh, with the governments on various uh, agenda like the climate change, the gender equity, food security, um, education, uh, public finance, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, 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 we we are just like the 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 basically the, the family doctor, uh, where you can uh, uh, bounce the idea, share your challenge uh, problems, um, and, and, and see what is up, what we can offer, right? So um, I, I think we work in that way. And I think uh, we, we do have um, that uh, contributing role in the process of uh, the regional uh, uh, integration and coordination. Thank you. Thanks, Ekapong. Uh, let me go on to the, to the next question here. Um, uh, what role could China play in facilitating the ASEAN economic community? We, we know that China is, a, is a, a, a major dialogue partner for ASEAN. Uh, I, I know from the past, my own experience, that uh, some of the other dialogue partners like Australia, the US, they do have like uh, uh, capacity building facilities, right, in, with, uh, uh, that support the ASEAN secretariat. But would any of you know? I mean, what uh, what kind of other examples in terms of the role that China can play to support the AEC? Um. Yeah, I could try. It's just like okay. a broad answer. Uh -huh. yeah. Given like um, you mentioned on your introduction earlier, like one of the most recent development is like the R seven, the signing of R seven acceptance of yeah. R seven. Yes. So I think um China is like. Um, we would like to think that this it is an ASEAN-led um mega trade agreement, but at the same time, before like the conversation during the adoption of RCEP um last year, um it was branded as to be like a China-led uh, mega trade agreement. So I think um with this, I think through RCEP, like China could uh, have like facilitating role in the achievement or maybe just some of the of our yeah, yeah, and and um, yeah. Sometimes the media get uh, uh, 
tend to mistake it as a China-led uh, feature again. We know it's an ASEAN-led. But having said that, uh, given the fact that China is second largest economy or you know in, in the world, I mean that basically increases the, the the size of the free trade agreement. I mean, I think that the numbers I've seen is like in terms of value is thirty percent of global GDP. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's an indirect role that they play, and it supports the the, the initiative of uh, uh, having a global ASEAN. Julia, you wanted to say something too, right? Yeah, maybe just just briefly. I mean, obviously, China has been a very significant trade partner of ASEAN, also an investment partner, although perhaps you know much more on the on on uh, um, on the trade side. And I think you know it has a very key role in helping to facilitate um, uh, um, 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 supply chain participation for um, ASEAN um, uh, um, 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 for, for 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 ASEAN, and probably a good entry point for both supply chain participation, but also. Uh, to stimulate uh, regional value chain development, uh, but at the same time noting that you know ASEAN need to also uh, uh, consider supply chain resilience and ensure things like risk diversification and then things like that. That's one, and I think secondly, uh, not just ASEAN but also uh, China, but also with um, any other partners of um, uh, um, uh, of ASEAN. Um, uh, uh, they have a key role, for example, in uh, in ensuring uh, um, ASEAN centrality. Uh, by basically supporting the existing ASEAN frameworks for uh, cooperation or even strategies and roadmaps, for example, including, for example, the uh, the connectivity or uh, uh, and, and 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 also other um, agenda um, as well. And in some cases, yes, we do have um, develop uh, development partners supporting um, ASEAN uh, programs and initiatives in very specific uh, uh, agenda. I don't have it at the top of my head, like what uh, on which one as China is concentrating on, but certainly, you know, different people, my uh, different uh, partners may have a different um, uh, 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 focus. So, for example, we know the EU, for example, has been supporting ASEAN a lot on um, trade facilitation, uh, the US, perhaps on the uh, digital agenda, for example. And there's also many, I think, other areas that ASEAN can also benefit from uh, China's experience when it comes to building its um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, industrial capacity, building up its economic productivity, for example, uh, and also perhaps you know in uh, in building up, as, as, as I mentioned, the skills and the human capital that it needs to uh, to, to come to upgrade its participation in the value chain. And I think last but not least, again, not just applicable to China, but also other partners. Um, ASEAN has great interest in ensuring the continued upholding of an open, inclusive, and rules-based uh, multilateral trading system and global economic governance. And I think ASEAN should work with any partners that share that same values, uh, uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, with the global decoupling and so on, they might be specific opportunities for ASEAN to benefit, but we know that this benefit is not going to be even, uh, even evenly spread across ASEAN member states. And this benefit do not substitute the full benefits of, of what ASEAN has been benefiting from these you know, open and stable and rules-based kind of uh, 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 economic governance globally. All right. Yeah, maybe I can ask related to this question. Maybe I can ask Echo Paul from the ADB's point of view too, because I do know that uh, regional cooperation integration is a very important strategy for ADB, and I think uh, and and I think AEC is very much covered as part of the. Well, I think they see it as, as, as from a sub regional point of view. I believe I, I, you can correct me, um, but is it possible for some of the for countries like China or, or others to participate with ADB on some of these? Uh, projects that ADB has on technical assistance to, to, to support, you know, some of these uh, sub-regional programs in Southeast Asia is is, uh, is is that possible? Do you know? Or it has yeah, to be done it's, through institutions. Uh, it's possible, um, you know, your old office in ADB, right? Uh, we have the GMS secretariat, uh, uh, whereby the, the PRC is one of uh, the, the the counterpart um, uh, under the the sub-regional grouping under the Great Greater Mekong sub-region. Um, I, I think uh, uh, just just to pick up uh, Dr. Julia. Um, I, I think uh, uh, given uh, the, the PRC uh, economic roles uh, in the region in terms of being the large uh, trading and investment partner with ASEAN, right? 
it really emphasized uh, the need for uh, uh, ASEAN centrality, um, and it also um, uh, re emphasized, re -emphasized uh, the need uh, for uh, ASEAN member countries uh, uh, to be uh, seamlessly integrated. Um, this is go back to the, the classic uh, theoretical um, uh, uh, from the international economic perspective in terms of being hubs and spoke, right? Um, uh, without uh, the AEC, basically uh, uh, each of uh, the Southeast Asian country uh, become the spoke, right? Um, and when uh, the when we have the economic open trade openness, right? Um, in terms of the, the welfare that we can uh, have from the, the trade openness um, uh, will be less compared to when we have the regional economic integration and each of the member countries uh, become the hub of the, the integration. In that sense, uh, AEC, by staying together, uh, will have a side of uh, a more wage uh, and being uh, able to tap on the benefits um, of uh, the, the trade and investment uh, openness, uh, especially in face of the large economy um, uh, like uh, PRC. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, I think uh, 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 we have, ADB has been uh, working quite closely uh, with uh, 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 Southeast Asian member countries, um, especially um, uh, CLMV countries uh, under the GMS. Um, uh, a greater Mekong sub-region uh, where we also have the active dialogue uh, involving uh, the PRC authorities. Thank you. Right. Um, I think we are. Oh, I think we are. We're probably running out of time for any more questions. Although we've we've run through the questions, uh, most of the questions from the audience. I, I do have my own questions, but I think we don't. We only have a few minutes left. But let me try to summarize quickly. Um, so all, all your discussions. Uh, I mean, my sense is that um, uh, I think it's, as we agreed, I think there's uh, a lot has been done leading up to the midterm review of the AEC 2025, but we do we do, we do recognize that there's a, a lot of uh, challenges. I mean, no one expected, you know, this one in a century pandemic occurring uh, in, and uh, as well as uh, other issues like the war in Ukraine, raising inflation. So, um, there's, there's essentially unfinished, I think we all agree that there's unfinished work that needs to be done uh, leading up to 2025. And I think that also leads to one of the questions that are probably what will need what needs to be done is uh, to, there will be another blueprint, I, I'm assuming, after 25. And I think, Jane, you talked about the fact that maybe we need to also recalibrate how we want to achieve these uh, uh, new targets, right, that there might be in the new blueprint. Um, and uh, maybe the maybe the focus is to try to make sure that it's a it's a high impact, recognizing uh, what all the ASEAN members have been through during the pandemic, you know the kind of the vulnerabilities that they had, and what they need to be do uh, need to do about it. Whether it's you know to be better coordinated through different kinds of regional mechanisms, or um, strengthening if, it, if we're talking about public health, strengthening the the public health sector, for example. That's one of the things that we've. I, in my research, we found that you know many of the economies around the Asia Pacific region were not prepared enough. They're not. They were not spending enough in public healthcare. Hence, when you have a, a pandemic like that, many of the, many of the countries were ill prepared to address or to contain the pandemic. Um, that's one of the concerns. That um, and then I think we all talked about also um, you know some of the new emerging challenges. I think all of you talked about the digital economy, and you know my my point of view as well is that there are pros and cons. Digital economy is great; it creates new jobs, uh, and and it's an important driver uh, as we move forward beyond now uh, now and beyond beyond twenty twenty five. But there's also a negative side to it as well because we do know that there is a digital divide, not just an economic divide within ASEAN, which is a probably a topic from our next counterpoint. But there's also a digital divide and how uh, ASEAN economies can work together to strengthen digital connectivity as well will be quite quite important. And also, and I think we all know this, there's also with um, the emergence of new digital technologies and artificial intelligence, uh, jobs are being displaced, right? Um, uh, and the, the rate of uh, of change and transformation is, is, is has been much more rapid. Maybe due to the pandemic, you see many companies adopting uh, digital uh, technology faster than they, what they would have because they, they, they had to stay in business, right? So they, they had to, you know, sell their goods and services on online platforms. In a, in a way, it's a lifesaver. But the concern, of course, is that 
it may lead to job displacements and 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 the need for reskilling and i think julia talked about that too uh, and also egg upon about what, what, how can we mobilize domestic resources to, to address some of these uh, emerging uh, challenges and, and digital economy to me is one of the things that we we also need to look out for it there's plus and minuses to benefiting from the from the digital economy um so I, I think that that's really it I mean the 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 webinar is uh is uh, is now over and I like really really like to thank all our speakers Julia Jean Egapon for a great discussions we had some great insights from here so and I maybe for the benefit of the audience too I think what we'll be doing is that uh the the uh the, the video itself I think it will, will and 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 there will be a publication of essays written by the three speakers and that will be out in about two weeks time so please do do uh look out for that so once again thank you very much uh to Julia Jean Egapon for for participating in this webinar Thank, thank you again. Thank you, Denise. Thank, thank you, you, Denise. Thank you. 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 Th